Do you ever feel lonely? Not just lonely due to having the lack of companionship or friends or a social circle, but this deeper existential sense of being all alone. Is there anyone out there that cares? Loneliness can be one of the most devastating experiences, precisely because it's not loud. It's like sense of feeling lost at sea. Do you matter? Of course it's connected to love, but can someone else really fill the void of a person's loneliness? We all need love. But there's also a sense of filling that empty space. What can we do about it? What is the root of loneliness? Please join me in this discussion, the Kabbalah of existential loneliness. How to understand what it is and what we can do about it to feel connected and attached to something just beyond ourselves. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and we'll be speaking about the Kabbalah of Existential Loneliness. This program is dedicated by William Molinero in honor of his daughters, Ella, Nora, Rita, Rosa, and his son, Wade. They should grow to recognize the oneness of God. Do you ever feel lonely? All alone? And not only in the sense of lack of a companion or friends or a social circle or support system. That's obviously all vital. But even with that, there are times that you just feel at the end of a day, even if you go to a party and everything is great, you walk home alone. Is there anyone out there that cares? Are we at the end of the day just isolated entities with everybody just taking care of themselves unless it serves their interest and we're left alone like lost at sea. We know that loneliness can be devastating. Not because it's loud and aggressive but even in its silence the fact that you feel that nobody is out there. And again, I'm not just talking about people. There's that existential loneliness that we experience. Obviously, growing up in a home that's loving and caring develops an element of connections and attachment, which is the counterforce to loneliness, where you feel you belong, you feel someone cares about you unconditionally, That goes a long way in building our confidence, building our security. But even then, there can still be that feeling in the back of your mind that with all those that care about you, there are certain things that nobody can enter your very private, intimate space. And you may go to a party and celebrate. And I don't just mean superficial on a profound level. At the end of the day, you walk home alone. One of the saddest scenes is when you see entertainers, musicians, where just a few minutes earlier, ten, thousands, tens of thousands of people were applauding, were celebrating, were even worshiping them. And then as the show ends and everybody 
makes their way out, going back home. You see them packing their guitars, packing their bags. I always think about it at the end of a, a tennis match. And you see the tennis player packing his own bags, carrying it out. That's the custom. There's something about it where at the end, with all the adulation and ovations and standing ovations, you walk alone on this earth. And when you think about it, it can be quite devastating. Not the lonely part alone, but the fact, does anyone care? Does it matter? Does it really matter what you do? When someone is waiting for you, they're waiting up at night, where are you? There's an element they care. It just creates an, a, a powerful connection. One of the most ter- horrible things to see is a homeless person. And you wonder, a person sitting, lying on the street, where the, where's the family? Where are the relatives? I'm not, I'm not trying to blame them. I understand it's not that simple at times. But the sadness of a person without a shelter, without a roof over their heads, without anyone caring. But we don't have to go to that extreme. All of us, even with all the homes and all our securities and all our material comforts, there's still that internal gnawing feeling. And I would submit that many of the things we turn to, to numb that loneliness, to numb that pain, is in order to avoid the issue. Too painful to think about it. So we do things. Some are healthy, many are unhealthy. To distract ourselves. Some dance to remember, some dance to forget. And in that context, we can get ourselves into deep trouble because we don't want to feel alone. I remember once counseling a couple. They were having domestic issues between each other. Very comfortable materially and financially, but emotionally, psychologically, they were growing apart to the point that constant bickering. And I asked them a simple question. I said, so what happens at dinner in the evening when you come together at home? They looked at each other, then looked at me, and in a very awkward way giggled. They said, we don't eat dinner at home. We go out almost every night. And if not, it's due to some if someone has a cold or something else that we have to do. Why not? Why don't you just have a dinner looking at each other? It's too uncomfortable. What are we going to talk about? We go out to dinner. Either there are friends there, or you talk about the menu, and the meal, the service. There's plenty to talk about. The weather. All to avoid direct, intimate, personal connection. Sad. And many other, many other scenarios that capture the loneliness of this world. Leonard Cohen sings it in a very, in a scathing fashion. You know, where a person has been alone, have their life, and then offers their companion and says, Let's, let us be alone together. Or in Billy Joel's words, let us drink a, drink a cup called loneliness better than drinking alone. So you share your loneliness with someone else. You share the misery. And may create the illusion that it's not that lonely. In the Bible it does say, very powerful verse, that talks about the essence of union. Male and female, God created them. Marriage, union, a sacred union. It is no good for a person, for a man to be alone. There's something incomplete I don't just mean that as someone that you have on your arm that goes to the party with you. You have someone, you're not just walking in alone. People, like dinner for one, which can be so painful for some. So you have someone with you. But it's deeper than that. Not to be alone, to know there's someone that cares and someone you care for. So there are two ways to look at every issue and challenge. One is you look at the symptoms and the other at the roots. At the symptomatic level, 
So today, hey, with technology, it's very easy not to feel, not to feel alone, even though it makes you even more lonely. You just go online to your favorite game, to your favorite site, you browse, you move here, you move there. Sports, gambling, whatever other addiction it may be, that keeps you busy and makes you feel less alone because you're, being, you're living vicariously through others and makes you feel stimulated. You go to a stadium, you go to a game, or as I mentioned before, a rock concert. And you're yelling and screaming with tens of thousands of others. Everyone seems to be in unison. You're not alone. But then this, the, game, the game is over. The show is over. And everybody, as they make their way out of the stadium, is walking alone. So these are distractions, and we have many today. But it doesn't resolve the real problem. At best, the symptoms, or some of the symptoms. So how do we deal with it from the root? And to get to the root, you have to understand the root of loneliness. So here's a fascinating take. Let's call it dissecting the anatomy of loneliness, of existential loneliness. So let's talk about a a section, a phrase, a statement, I could say, in Kabbalistic text. This is coming from the book called The Tree of Life, Eitz Chaim, from the Isaac Luria, the famous 16th century mystic. Interestingly, for many years he wasn't known. His mystical genius was only known for a year and eight months in Sfat, northern Israel. And then he died at a young age, close to the age of 38, 39, between that year, those years. But he left us a tremendous body of work it's called the writings of the this the writings of the result. Even though he didn't write it, his student Rab Chaim Vital wrote it. That's why many of the books are called by the name Chaim, Eitz Chaim, Tree of Life, Otsus Chaim. So in the Eitz Chaim, which is a classic work, a magnum opus, you can call it a cosmic map. Lays out the root of all loneliness, and this is paraphrasing a close, close translation of what he says, that before it all, and when we say before, we don't mean physical time, it's conceptual, the initial state of existence and pre-existence was all oneness, a seamless oneness. Think of an infinite sea of seamlessness. And what dominated or actually the only thing that existed was divine higher consciousness. And there, wasn't even, there weren't even two entities. It was all a fundamental, inherent unity. It shouldn't, shouldn't surprise anyone who's familiar with physics that sees the universe as intrinsically unified. Despite the details, but under the, beneath the surface, it's one, as some put it, it's all like one quilt, one field of energy, a oneness, a singularity. And then the divine consciousness wanting to fulfill a purpose, which was to create an, another consciousness, an independent consciousness, that would come to connect with it, with the original consciousness, concealed itself concealed its conscious state, the famous Tzimtzum doctrine, sometimes called the secret of the Tzimtzum, say that Tzimtzum, the secret doctrine of Tzimtzum, of concealing, withdrawing, in a sense receding, not fundamentally leaving, but creating space, a classic example, given by Rav Shneir Zalman of the Yadi, of a teacher creating space for a student, the teacher's brilliance, if it just flows, would be overwhelming and not allow anyone to receive. Relationship, by definition, requires creating space, boundaries. The first space is being quiet and allowing a student to emerge. And then connecting, like in a spoon feeding, a small, a, laser, a very narrow laser beam of energy 
that flows from teacher to student. But initially, you need silence. You need a type of a pause, a receding of the energy, the consciousness, that allows for an independent consciousness. This is the birth of all loneliness. Because when all that consciousness is all aware of and there's nothing else, there's obviously no room for feeling lonely. Lonely would mean that there's a film of a disconnect. Something was severed. So yes, the purpose of it is a good purpose, to create independent entity in order for there to be a relationship. But in that first stage, think of the cutting of the umbilical cord. The fetus was seven, nine months completely submerged in the embryonic waters, being fed, being nurtured, being protected. The cutting of the umbilical cord signifies a beginning of its own reality. And indeed we know that a mother and father, who are, or the child is taken away from mother and father at a very early stage, will always have consequences. Because there's something for the need of connection. Feeling part of something else. So in a cosmic level, that's the symptom. The purpose of this was to create an independent consciousness so we can have a relationship. But the side effect that can emerge from it is now, oh, I'm alone. Let's read together the verses in the Bible. After Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge. Up till that point, their consciousness, they were not self-conscious because their consciousness was part of a higher reality. They felt they were part of something bigger than themselves. But as soon as they ate from the tree of knowledge, now they've experienced their own pleasure, their own desire. There's a disconnect and a dissonance. And that's why they felt that, they, they, that's why they were ashamed that they were naked. Why weren't they ashamed earlier? Because a newborn child, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Nakedness is part of our reality. We're not self-conscious. You are what you are. A fish in water. But now, suddenly you sense yourself. So you feel guilt. You feel shame. You feel, I'm somewhat separate from that higher reality. And that's when the Bible tells us that God comes into the garden looking for Adam. Adam is hiding from him, from shame, what he did. So God says to Adam, where are you? So the obvious question is, what do you mean, where are you? God needs to ask that question. He can't see that Adam is hiding. And the answer given a beautiful answer. This is a question that God asks all of us in all times, at all times throughout history, every one of us. There'll be a point where we will be asked, where are you? Where are you doesn't mean physically, where are you? Where's your head? Where's your heart? Where's your soul? You know, sometimes you're sitting there, someone, they're right there, but they space out. They're not present. So you ask, where are you? doesn't mean, of course you see them sitting in the chair. You're not with me. I don't feel you're with me. God's saying, I feel you've disconnected. I feel alone. And I know that you feel alone. You've betrayed yourself. That's when you hear about shame, people betraying themselves. They had a destiny. Things were going well, and then something happens. That's a deep sense of loneliness. The loneliness is not just that there isn't anyone else there with you. It's a sense of disconnect, all rooted in the symptom and that concealment. The point of it is to find deeper, even deeper connection of two entities that come to love each other. But initially, it creates tremendous existential loneliness. That just that sense. You know, think about it. No one should ever know of it, but when someone close to you, close to someone, dies... What is really the pain involved? You know, if you believe, and who doesn't, that there's a soul, the soul lives on. The spirit, the personality. However, the pain is that you don't experience it in your domain, in your world. Even if that soul sees you, you don't see it. You feel alone. You feel, where did the soul go to? I was able to embrace it. I was able to speak to it. And now. So it's a disconnect that this material world manifests. We don't feel our source. We don't feel connected. We don't feel we belong. And hence this profound loneliness. So it doesn't come from nowhere. 
it's rooted in this, in this very dissonance. <clears throat> and then, of course, it can devolve to deeper levels and deeper levels to the point of extreme pain, of feeling all alone. No one cares. Dog eats dog. A selfish world. Interested only in its own needs. And they care about you when they need something from you. So that only feeds that conviction that we're all alone. But this is all part of the plan, the concealment. It's only a concealment. The great Maggot of Mizrij gives the example of a, of a father hiding from his children in order to elicit, to evoke their ingenuity. But he hides well, to the point that the children think he's abandoned them. So it's a feeling of abandonment, again, the loneliness and of abandonment. When in truth, do not give up because he's there. And here too, here comes the antidote, the solution. The solution, my friends, is based on this very root. Once you understand the root of it, it's not going to be solved by numbing yourself. It's not going to be solved by avoiding it, by distracting, by creating false forms of connection. Now, sexuality, taking sexuality, one of the most powerful forms of bonding, maybe the most powerful of all, where two people become like one flesh in the words of the Bible. It's a tremendous connection. But what happens when a person does not have healthy sexuality and they turn to titillation and stimulation not from someone that loves you, porn, objectifying it just for the pleasure, for the moment, it creates the illusion of union. But there's no union going on without the sanctity of a relationship, of two people caring for each other, not just during the act of sexuality, but overall, that it's more of a noun, a state of being love, than just an act. The state of being are two people who are really bound to each other and care about each other all the time. And look how lonely it makes you feel. Literally just a few days ago, I was talking to someone who came to see me. He's talking about his sex addictions. And he says, the more I seek it out, the lonelier I become. So for the moment, I have a rush of excitement. And then I feel even more lonely than ever. Literally like a sugar high. You get high, and then you need more. You need another shot. How do I get out of this vicious cycle, this pattern? So it requires revisiting what exactly is true connection and not trying to replace it with false connections, not trying to resolve and relieve the loneliness through false forms of connection and communication and, and companionship. It's not about renting a companion or escaping for a little while. So what's the solution? To go back to the pre simpson reality, to realize there is an intrinsic and inherent unity between everything in this world, between people for sure, but even between you and the, and the activities that you do. And here's where the mystics and the Kabbalists explain that you are on a mission in this world to find the divine sparks and connect everything that has come your way to some higher purpose. And when you do that, that's how you relieve, that's how you resolve existential loneliness. Not by escaping from it, not by ignoring it, not by avoiding it or creating false forms of connection, but by truly connecting and truly recognizing that all the fragments of your life are part of spokes connected by one hub, by one mission statement. And that is to elevate the sparks that were allocated to you that are spread and scattered throughout your life. In the food you eat, in the, water, in, the, in the drinks you drink, in your sleep, in your work, in your leisure in your personal matters, in your in, intrapersonal and interpersonal, your interactions, social interactions, everything. Whatever you're involved in has these sparks, but the sparks right now are scattered in the Kabbalistic terminology due to the shattering of the containers. So think of a page of a book or an entire book that's torn into pieces and then scattered. So there's a narrative there, but the narrative is now scattered and it's our job is to reconnect again the scattering creates loneliness. Every letter or every part of a letter feels lost, feels alone, 
because it's seeking the other parts of the letter like a jigsaw puzzle to connect and all together to create one larger narrative the narrative of your life so all this is the way this we resolve that initial loneliness. So the symptom creates the concealment, the feeling of being separate, the feeling of the fragmentation of life. And the solution is to reconnect, to take the different parts of your life and find that over- overarching and underlying purpose. How you're using your skills, your opportunities, your time, all your experiences towards something greater, a higher purpose. Transforming your corner of the world into a beautiful spiritual environment. An exercise that can help you do this. At the end of any given day, and you can do this every day, and you'll see what kind of change it creates in your life. Sit down and List all the things you did that day. From the moment you woke up, from the first conscious moment of your day. You press the snooze button, or you finally woke up, your regimen, you exercised, took a shower, ate breakfast, coffee, whatever it may be. Ran for your commute, went to work, worked remotely, had a meeting or two, lunch break, tea break, interactions. List them all. The bigger, big and small. Important and trivial. All the way to the evening. You come home, all the evening activities. You'll come up usually with a list of around 100 items. Even if they're not connected, including tying your shoelaces or going walking and, walk, and going to a store just to shop around. Just using all the examples. And then try to connect these 100 items or whatever the amount they are what relationship they have with each other. In most cases, they won't have much relationship. In some cases, I commuted in order to get to work, or I commuted in order to meet a friend. So you may think, okay, so what? A hundred fragments of my day. But then they accumulate, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade century after century, millennia after millennia, millions, if not billions, of fragments. And we know fragmentation, nature abhors fragmentation. So does a human being. When you see everything scattered in your home and there's no order, there's something unnerving about it. Even little children, what do they do? They take objects of different shapes and sizes and they fit them in to the corresponding holes. A sphere within a sphere, a square within a square, a rectangle within a rectangle, a triangle within a triangle. Because we naturally gravitate to what? To unity. The opposite of fragmentation, the opposite of loneliness. So here's the, the exercise, the solution. Now look at all those items and say, what's the connection between them? There is no connection. But here is the key. In the morning, before you began... Say that one line prayer, that one line meditation. Moda'ani, thank you for returning my soul to me. Thank you for giving me an indispensable mission in this world. The mission of spiritualizing your material world. And then, the rest of the day is just the implementation of that one mission. So from tying your shoelaces to commuting, to reading a book, a magazine, meeting people, whatever it may be, all get connected because all, it's all part of fulfilling that one singular mission. Now I say singular, it takes on many different shapes and forms, but it's all connected. Like a good business person, not just nine to five, not just when he's doing business, whoever he meets, every encounter becomes an opportunity. Here we're talking about spiritual opportunities that connect. And realizing that every encounter and interaction you have has been waiting for you to come there and create that connection. So number one, it resolves the loneliness issue because you're not alone. You're fulfilling a mission, a divine mission. Whether you like the word God or not, but God is with you, the mission is with you, in everything you do, you're not alone. You're not just wandering at lost at sea. 
You have a mission. Secondly, you become proactive. You don't wait for something to happen, which only adds to loneliness. You're proactively bringing something into your life, inspiring others in the same way. There's no greater antidote, no greater solution to loneliness than when you invite people to your home, to your environment. You invite them to a project that you're doing. Use technology in that way, connecting people, sharing a kind word, a beautiful word, something inspiring, something heartwarming, showing gratitude. So there are actions that we can do that are actually connectors that counter the existential loneliness of our lives. Or in using the mystical terms, that counter the tzimtzum, the tzimtzum which conceals and allows for a sense of fragmentation, a sense of dissonance, sense of disconnect. You're countering that by shining a light into this dark place, by bringing connections. And indeed, mitzvahs means connections. Connecting you and your purpose, connecting you and others, connecting you and the divine. And that is the ultimate antidote, the ultimate solution. So it's not just about eliminating loneliness. It's about transforming it and seeing that the, the concealment that caused the loneliness is transformed to create deeper unity and deeper connection between parts and pieces that may seem disparate, may seem disconnected or fragmented. So the Kabbalah of existential loneliness is both the root of the cause of it and most importantly, what we do to counter it. Initiate. Invite people to your home. Invite someone to be your companion studying together, praying together, doing something charitable, a good deed together. Inspire others. Wherever you go and 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 whoever you meet, find ways to connect. Let's share a common goal. Let's discuss some way to help a third party. There's so many things we can do, small and large, that counter the split, the schism of existential loneliness and brings a deeper unity. So I bless you with the wisdom, fortitude, commitment, and courage to fight the war against fragmentation, to fight the war against dissonance, to fight the war against existential loneliness by introducing unity and harmony, harmony within diversity. Be blessed and be well. This is Simon Jacobson of Meaningful Life Center. Meaningfullife.com is our website. Please subscribe to our offerings, to our YouTube channel, and check it out, a wide array of materials a calendar of events covering all types of topics, you name it, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Please share if you found this meaningful. And please, I'd love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your comments, your suggestions. We are, after all, all parts, indispensable parts of one larger cosmic symphony. Thank you and be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.